Yo. Is this thing on? Welcome back to another episode of Son of a Preacher Man. As always, I'm your host, the Soap Man. Here to clean your mouth out. Ladies and gentlemen, that's M-O-U-F, mouth. Here to clean your mouth out with another episode. So check this out. We're going to jump right off into it. But I want to let you know this before we get started. I had the darnest time coming up with a title for this episode. So after some after some thought, I settled on the ruler. And you're going to see why in a minute. It's, it's kind of ironic, if I must say so myself. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Soap Man proudly presents the second book of Samuel, part four, The Ruler. Okay, so check this out. We're talking about King David. In my last episode... King David brought home the Ark of the Covenant. And what I want you to know before we even get started today is this man has established himself as king. He didn't just become king and he just sitting comfortable. He became king. He went to war with the Philistines. He crushed them in spectacular fashion. And then he brought back the Ark of the Covenant. It was very important to him. He jumped through hoops and bent over backwards to bring back the Ark of the Covenant with him. Because it's not just enough for David to be king. David wants God to have his back. And so David takes measures to make sure he's in good standing with God. And it is for that reason that David is not just king, but he is an established king. He has established himself. The Philistines came at him as soon as he became king. He defeated them in battle. He brought back the Ark of the Covenant. And now he is not just a king. He is an established king. King. He is a dominant king. He has established dominion. And so we're going to get into this story of how King David rules. So 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 1 through 7 reads, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. See, that's what I mean when I say David has established himself as king. He got anointed king. He defeated anybody who would challenge his reign or his rule. And now he, he and after that, he brought back the Ark of the Covenant. And now he's sitting pretty. He's sitting comfy, not just because he's king but because he is an established king. And how did he do that? He used God to do that. That was the purpose of bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. So it says, and it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the Ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a, shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, 
whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? Now let me unpack what I just read. So David is sitting pretty in his house. He's an established ruler, an established king in Israel. And he says to himself, I want to do something for God. I want to do something for the God who has established me as a dominant ruler in Israel. And he says, it's not fair that I'm dwelling in this nice house of wood and stone that I've had these expert masons build for me and that my God dwells in a tent. See, the Ark of the Covenant, it still dwells in the, in the tent like tabernacle. So David says, that's not fair. Why should my dwellings be better than the God that I worship, than the God that established me? Then the, then why should my surroundings and environment be better than the God that I worship? He's God. So God sends a message to David's prophet, Nathan. And, and it's very interesting what he tells Nathan to tell David. He says to Nathan, go tell David, what do I look like some dude? that I need you to build me a house? He says, what am I, a man, that I should dwell in a house like you? He says, all this time that I've been with the children of Israel, all this time, even back when I brought them up out of Egypt, did I complain that I was living in a tent? He says, I was content li living in a tent. I don't need your house. What he's really telling David is, look, dude, I'm God. The very earth is my footstool. What does a house mean to me? Now, it seems arrogant, but you got to understand this is coming from God. So it's just fact. He's telling David, dude, I mean, I appreciate the gesture, but come on now. Recognize who I am. Picture this. Picture me as broke as I am trying to give Elon Musk a loan. Picture me writing Jeff Bezos and asking him, does he need five bucks for lunch? He gonna look at me like, insolent fool, you peasant. I've got billions. What am I gonna do with five dollars? Now extrapolate that. This is God we talking about. So you see where I'm coming from. He's not trying to be arrogant or rude to David. He's just letting him know, recognize who you talking to. I don't need a house. The entire universe is my house. Second Samuel chapter seven verses eight through 13 reads, now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time, and as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish, key word here, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom for 
forever. And I have that last line in big, bold, red print. Look at me, please. God tells David, so you want to build me a house? David, come on, stop it, stop it. No, seriously, though. I'm going to build you a house. You are my chosen. And not only am I going to build you a house, I'm going to give you rest from all the enemies that are around you. He says, and not only that, I'm going to do you a solid. He says, one of your descendants is going to build my house. He says, and I'm going to establish your bloodline forever. Big words coming from the big man upstairs. Second Samuel chapter eight, verses one through eight reads. And after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Methegamah out of the hand of the Philistines. I guess that's a, a town or a city. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line. Did you catch that last part? It says, and he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. David smote also Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and 700 horsemen and 20,000 footmen. And David hoffed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for an hundred chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to succor Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. Notice I have, notice what I have in bold red print. If you see my arrow here, it says, after the well, just let's go back to the top. It says, after this came to pass, David smote the Philistines and, in big bold rip, subdued them, established dominion over them. He made them servants. He took cities out of their hands. And after that, he smote Moab, measuring them with the line. I'm going to unpack all this. Just give me a second. Casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became servants to David and brought gifts. Then David smote Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. Go down to what I have in big bold red print. After that, he slew the, Syr the Syrians. He put garrisons in Syria of Damascus in Syria of Damascus and the Syrians became servants to David and broad gifts I have in big bold red print and then it says and the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went and David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem and from Beta that may mean that I may that may supposed to be an L and from Bela and from Barothai, cities of Hadadezer, king of, king of Zobah, David took exceeding much brass. Let's unpack this. The Bible says David defeated the Philistines and he subdued them. That means he made them servants. He took from them. He took cities out of their hands, defeated their armies and subdued them. Then he defeated King Hadadezer, and we're going to unpack this story because the Bible jumps around with these, with these different stories. It doesn't give you a perfect timeline. You have to figure it out. 
it, it tells you, but it doesn't tell, it tells you what's going on, but it doesn't put it in a nice pretty box or package for you, okay? But I'm, um, good thing there's a soap man to sort it all out and clean it all up for lack of a better word. No, it's not for lack of a better word. I meant to say that, pun intended. Then it says, he defeated the Syrians, and I'm going to explain all this, okay? Just trust me. Then he defeats the Syrians, okay? And he subdues them. No, I'm sorry. After he defeats the Philistines, he defeats the Moabites. And the Bible says he measures them with a line. He measures with two lines who to put to death. And with one line, who to keep alive. I'm going to explain that. And then after that, he fights King Hadadezer. And he does King Hadadezer the same way he did the Moabites and the same way he did the Philistines. He subdues them. He takes from them. And they, end, they all end up bringing him gifts. So what does that mean when the Bible says David uses a line to measure who he puts to death and who he keeps alive. What they mean is he uses a ruler. Let me explain to you real quick. Have you ever heard of the great conqueror Genghis Khan? Okay. Genghis Khan was a Mongolian conqueror and he conquered probably more territory than any other conqueror in history now we're not gonna get into Genghis Khan's tactics because it's not important for this video but something Genghis Khan did was similar to what David did what Genghis Khan did at least one time, but probably more than one time. But it, this is recorded. You can look it up. You can research it. Google it. After conquering a city, or sometimes even before conquering a city, he would tell his men, kill anything that's taller than the wheel on my wagon. Or he'd say, kill anything that's taller than the axle on my chariot or kill anything that's taller than the spokes on my chariot. I can't remember if it was the wheel, the axle, or the spoke, but you get what I'm saying. Moses did something similar to this back in the day. I don't know if you remember. You'd have to go back to some of my earlier episodes, but Moses, when he attacked or had the children of Israel, rather, attack the Midianites, the children of Israel defeated the Midianites, but they brought back a very great spoil. And what Moses says is, you've kept too many people alive. He says, you can keep alive any young woman who is not laying with a man, but everybody else got to go. Genghis Khan did something similar, and what he's doing is very strategic. He doesn't want to war or have a rebellion later on. When he, when Genghis Khan took a city or took a village or destroyed an army, he destroyed anything that he perceived as a threat. So when he says kill anything that's bigger than my, the, the spokes on my chariot or the wheel on my wagon, what he's saying is basically kill anybody that's over 16 years old. Well, not exactly. Uh, um, this is my way of putting it. Kill anybody who's taller than four feet. Kill anybody that's of a certain age. That's why, like Moses, like Moses said, kill any body, women, men, anybody. The women who have not lain with a man them you can keep as slaves. Ladies and gentlemen, if you say you can save any woman who hasn't lain with a man, you're talking about women who are like 10 and 11 years old because back then, women as old as 12 years old were married off to men sometimes. 
So what Moses was telling his people, and I hope I'm not confusing you jumping back and forth between David, Moses, and Genghis Khan, but they're all doing something similar. They're eliminating potential threats. They're eliminating the threat right now by destroying the army, but they're eliminating any potential threats that may rise up and rebel in the future by keeping only harmless children in Moses' case, harmless young virgin girls. No matter how big they get, they cannot rise and form up an army to attack you 20 years from now. They're women. In the case of Genghis Khan, he's killing anything that's taller than his wheel. That means you're just saving young children alive. So what David does is, which is why I named this episode the ruler. It's a play on words. Like he's the ruler, like the king. Get it? It's kind of like soap man, son of a preacher man. Get Okay, no, it's not like that. Anyway, the reason I called this episode the ruler is not because David is an established ruler, meaning he's the king, but he you he literally uses a ruler the bible calls it a line but as you see in this picture i've provided for you what the line really is is a ruler he's going to measure his prisoners his victims and depending on how big or tall they are with will determine whether they live or die not only that, all of these nations that David defeats, the Philistines, the Moabites, King Hadadezer, the Syrians, all of them become his subjects. The Bible says they bring gifts. He breaks their back. He not only breaks their back, he breaks their will. What you need to understand is this is how it's done. When you defeat your enemies, you completely break them. You deal with that mess right then and there so you don't have to deal with them 20 years later. And that's exactly what David does. He so break he not only breaks the backs of these people, he subdues them. He makes them his servants. He makes them his vassals. They work for him now. They don't want no smoke. The Bible says he hoffs all of King Hadadezer's uh, horse, horses. That means he chops them at the ankles. So nobody, they can never be used in battle again. He saves just enough of the horses for a hundred chariots, and that may be like a hundred or two hundred horses, because it only take one or two horses to draw a chariot. Maybe three or four. No more than three, no more than a few hundred horses David saves. This man is strategic. This man is smart. This man knows what he's doing. He is establishing dominion. And if you ever find yourself in his shoes or find yourself establishing dominion, this is how it's done. Second Samuel chapter eight, verses nine through 18 reads, when Toai, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the hosts of Hadadezer, then Toai sent Yoram, his son, unto King David to salute him and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and smitten him for Hadadezer had wars with Toai. Then Yoram brought with him vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass, which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he dedicated of all nations which he subdued, of Syria and of Moab and of the children of Ammon and of the Philistines and of Amalek and of the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David got him a name when he returned from smiting the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. And he put garrisons in Edom, 
Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And I have in big, bold, red print. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And David reigned over all Israel. And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the host. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. And Sariah was the scribe. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief rulers. I put this map up because I want to emphasize the impact of David's rule. This is a map of the original, this is a map of the area that David conquers. Okay, let me explain this to you. Here you have the tribe of Judah, and here you have the northern ten tribes. You have the tribe of Judah and Benjamin is down here in Judah. And Simeon is also down here in Judah. And the remaining tribes are up here in the north. So you have Judah and then you have Israel. And this is the territory that David inherits from King Saul, okay? Now you have, these are all the enemies that surround David's kingdom. You have the Philistines here, right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. You have Edom, down here east of the Jordan River. To the north of Edom, you have Moab. Then you got a little bit of Israel's territory, that's uh, where Gad settled. Budding right next door to them is the nation of Ammon. Then you have, you know, this is the area of Gilead and uh, this is the area that Manasseh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, M Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh is right here. Then above them you have Aram. These are the Syrians. Up here further north, you have Phoenicia. So as you see, because the children of Israel never totally annihilated all of their enemies this kingdom that David inherits is surrounded by enemies be wise remember we was talking about this how modern day Israel is surrounded by its enemies well it was just like that in the time that David inherit inherited the kingdom of Israel after Saul they are they were surrounded by enemies in antiquity and which means in ancient times and they are still to this day surrounded by enemies because they did not follow the laws of Moses Philist the Philistia where the Philistines are here to their left here to their right Edom Moab Ammon Aram is in the north Phoenicia is in the north they are literally surrounded by hostile nations that resent the fact that they took this land. And the Mediterranean Sea is over here, but I'm pretty sure if it was land right here, there'd be another enemy. Okay, now check out this next map. It says, the United Kingdom of Israel around the time of Saul and David. So this map isn't much different. Look at this map here. This next map is not much different than the previous one. Here you have Philistia, Amalek here in the south, Edom here in the southeast, Moab here in the southeast, Ammon here to the east of the kingdom of Israel, the Aramaeans, which is Syria, over here to the northeast, and above them to the north, is modern day Lebanon, which, which back then would, would be called Phoenicia. So they are still surrounded. At the time David inherits the kingdom from Saul, he doesn't inherit it from Saul, but 
at the time David becomes king after Saul, this is what his kingdom looks like. Now take into account everything I just read. When David becomes king, he defeats the Philistines. He makes them servants, they bring gifts. He defeats Amalek. He subdues them, they become his vassals, they bring gifts. He defeats Edom. They become his vassals, they bring gifts. He defeats Moab. They become his servants, they bring gifts. He defeats Ammon. They become his servants, they bring gifts. He defeats the Arameans, which are the Syrians. They bring gifts. Now, I'm going to fast forward to the end of David's reign. This is a map of what the kingdom of Israel looks like at the end of David's reign. He has, by the time David is done doing his due, he will have tripled. Hear me out. He will have tripled the square mileage of what he started with. Look at this map. Where you see the green, that's modern day Israel. But at the time of David's reign, he kicks so much booty that he is able to triple the size of his territory. Here's a better map. This is modern day Israel and they don't even have this much land. This isn't even modern day Israel because they only have a fraction of what you see in red. Okay? What I'm trying to show you because look, Gaza is right here. The Gaza Strip in modern day Israel is right here. And the West Bank is right here. So they only have two thirds today what you see in red. Israel is only like two thirds of what you see in red. But at the time of David, he quad, it's three times the size of what it is today. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to get across to you is David was obviously doing something right. And somewhere along the lines, somebody effed up royally. One last note. All these gifts that these surrounding subdued nations bring to David. All the spoil that he takes from them. He doesn't hoard it to himself. He doesn't put it in his treasure keep. He doesn't put it in his vault to spend it on parties, to throw lavish parties, and, you know, to gift to a bunch of his wives and concubines. He takes a good portion of it and donates it to his God who has put him in the position to accumulate all this wealth and territory. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is how it's done. If you want to know how to be successful, look at somebody who was successful. And David is the epitome of success. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not about to beat a dead horse. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. If you're new to this channel, hit that like and subscribe button. If you got any comments, compliments, or insults, leave them in the comment section. With that being said, I'll see you next time. Next episode. Same soap time, same soap channel. Thank you, stay safe. We out.